Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, and I'm here with Aaron. Hey, I'm Aaron, and uh, we're back today so I can ask Dr. Rob a lot of pointed questions and get some real answers. So the first one I have for you today is a lot of these implant failures that you talk about happen five, six, seven, or more years down the road. And yet for most of these, you're still saying that it's the doctor's fault. Why is that? That is absolutely true. And the reason is, is that these are mechanical failures that are so far removed from the doctor's placement of the, of the final prostheses that the, that the association between what the doctor did and the outcome is so far apart that no one, no one makes the association. So I think in, um, in some of the liberal sciences, they actually talk about uh, association between events. So um, I pull a weed out of the ground and lightning strikes at the same time. And, and then I'm a, I'm a primitive human way back in the you know, caveman days. And I think pulling the weed out of the ground caused the lightning because it was in close proximity to the action to what I did. So if you pull the weed or a carrot out of the ground and then lightning struck a week later, you humans would instinctively not correlate those two events. So the timing between two events re results in a correlation that we make instinctively. So with dental implants, they, they are mostly made out of metal and they, if they're not properly placed and properly restored, they result in something called fatigue failure. And fatigue failure has been reported to be about 90% of all mechanical failures, all mechanical failures. Wow. Like, it's like the biggest thing that we have to deal with. And what that comes from is repetitive loads. So if you have a, uh, a car and it goes over a lot of bumps over time, eventually the shocks get bad and you have to replace the shocks. That's fatigue cycling, fatigue loading. With dental implants, you have an implant in the mouth, you have a restoration, and every time that the teeth come in contact or they're chewing on food, there are loads applied to that system. And those loads, if the system is designed poorly, can result in failures, but here's the thing. They don't happen right away. Those failures happen two, three, four, five years later, and they're so far gone that if, if a patient has a failure at that time frame, they come back in the office, and typically as a, as, a, as a dentist, we say something like this, Mrs. Smith, what did you eat last night? And we put the onus on the patient, and many times it has nothing to do with what they ate last night, because you know what they say. They'll come back and say, I was eating bread. You know, that's the number one thing we hear. You know, I was just chewing soft bread when this broke. And that's true, but the bread didn't cause it. It was from all the years of cyclic fatiguing that caused it. So the cool thing about it is that many of the problems that I'm presenting here can be avoided. So if you, if you, um, if you actually design the system properly with a, just a little bit, just a little bit of basic engineering understanding, it's not complicated, no, no math, just common sense, uh, but applying some of the mechanical uh, principles that we learn in school, you can actually design a system that should last a lifetime. And I actually have to be very careful in my own private practice with uh, skirting, uh, telling the patient that I suspect that what I'm going to give them should last a lifetime, uh, you know, versus what I'm giving you will last a lifetime. You know, I have to be very careful because I have that much confidence in the dental implant systems that we place here. So what is it that, that makes the difference? Because if 90% of failures are, are due to fatigue, right, mechanical failures, what makes it so difficult to engineer that, and how are your systems getting around that? Well, you know what? I wouldn't say that it's difficult. It's just knowledge. If you think about this, it, 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 it should be very common in your mind to think that if I had, um, for instance, I have two branches. I have a very strong... Big, a big branch, a big six inch diameter branch, and I have a very small one, like you might even call it a twig. Which one of those would break easier? And you would say, well, obviously the twig would break under load easier than the big one. So where does this play in terms of dental implants? Well, sometimes people put a small implant in a location that would otherwise require a big implant. So for instance, a lower first molar. Okay, so in that space, the mesial distal distance is typically 10 millimeters. 
So you're looking at a at, at a starting point for the diameter of your implant somewhere in the five millimeter range using the one half rule. Okay, so one half the mesial distal distance gives you uh, one half of ten is about five millimeters. Well, here's the thing: that sometimes if people don't know the one half rule and they don't know understand the the reasons where it comes from, they'll say, "What do I have in the drawer?" And the assistant comes back and says, you have a 3.8 in the drawer. And they go, great, let's place it. So they put an undersized, i.e. a small branch, in the first molar position, which is the biggest tooth in the mouth, because God knew what? That tooth carries the biggest load, okay? So we know that tooth carries the biggest load, and now you put a small branch in a spot that should, should warrant a big branch. You put a small implant where you need a big implant. And then what happens? Because it's small, it doesn't break right away, and then we bite on it for a number of years, and then it breaks. Or the abutment screw loosens, or the abutment screw breaks inside, or the pros breaks on top. All of these mechanical failures are resulting from the initial selection of one thing only. In this case, just the size. So with that size, why doesn't the doctor know that that's going to occur? Like, where is the breakdown in knowledge getting delivered to that surgeon that's placing the implant? And why is that decision made? That's a great question as well. So I believe the problem is that we have um, a separation in our schooling system that says, you're going to be a dentist, so you might be inclined to take an undergraduate degree in biology which is very common. And there, there's nothing wrong with that. The, the problem that you have is that you take a biology undergrad and then you get a dental degree and then maybe you get a, a master's degree in perio or oral surgery or something like that. Never in there do you learn about how to design a screw. You have a materials course in dental school, but it's a high level gloss over, let me kind of get through it kind of course that people say, you know, I don't really need to know this stuff. It's, it's stuff that doesn't seem relevant at the time. And unfortunately, it probably should be uh, expounded on. It should probably be, it should probably be more of our curriculum um, because when you, when you build a bridge, just in the words that I'm saying, I'm building a bridge. If you said, this weekend, I'm going to build a bridge, people would say, what, are you an engineer? And then you say, no, I'm a dentist. <laughs> you say, oh, so we, we use terms like abutment. Abutment is an engineering term. It's not a dental term. Like we use it in dentistry, but it's, it's, it comes from engineering, okay? So when we build a bridge using abutments and we span across a pontic space, those things are engineering terms that we're borrowing, but we don't spend a lot of time looking at the mathematics behind it or the science behind it to determine exactly how to minimize those risks. Now we do have some rules. We, we, we have some, um, some rules that we use to help us. Uh, Ant's law, for instance, would be one that people will probably remember. They probably don't ever use it, but in their mind, they may be kind of roughly remembering the, the concept of that one. So there are these rough rules that we use, and that's the idea behind what, what I try to bring in my courses is a, a biomechanical perspective to help people understand that these simple decisions you're making make a huge difference in the outcome uh, in the short term and in the long term, and in particular with these fatigue failures in the long term. To summarize, I don't think that we just get experience because we're, we're learning in two different silos. On one side, you've got mathematics and engineering, and on the other side, you have the biological sciences, and there's not an opportunity to get a lot of cross-pollination between those two disciplines. And so that's where the, I think there's a void. So that's why when I teach this stuff, I tell people, I'm not going to teach you how to be a dentist. I'm not going to teach you how to be a doctor. That's, that's not what we do here. We're going to expose you to some concepts that are going to make you amazing at dental implants. Just, just It's going to be the easiest part of your entire practice because you're going to look at it and go, okay, these are the rules. And if I just stick within the rules, I'll have almost zero failures. Like you'll drive your failure rates darn near close to zero. And that's just an exciting thing. So when I say zero failures, I mean like low risk, zero failures, no peri-implantitis, and just drinking coffee every day and enjoying life or whatever beverage of choice. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a coffee drinker. Yeah. We, we discussed earlier, I'm not right. a fireball drinker either, yeah. so my choices are that's limited right. here. Yeah, if Dr. Bobby's here, she's like, whoa, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's not my beverage of choice. 
Well, thanks for answering that question today. I'll make sure to stay away from weeds during thunderstorms. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.